makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Dubai today with special coverage this hour from COP28. A lot going on. It is the 28th UN conference, of course, on climate change. Now, we have a great stellar lineup of many, many guests that will join us this hour. We already had some kind of deal yesterday. That puts everyone in a really good place. Now, we'll bring you interviews from COP, including with the chief executive of AstraZeneca. Uh, coming up, we also have the NG chief executive. Then we'll talk to the Prime Minister of Greece and the President of Sri Lanka. So this is what we know so far in terms of what the agenda has been laid out. A part of 70,000 politicians, diplomats, campaigners, financiers and business leaders are here in Dubai from COP28. The Brazilian President Lula da Silva has just addressed the summit. We also heard Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz are all among those coming today. Now the hosts, the UAE, have also announced a commitment of $30 billion to help finance climate solutions. So COP28 has already scored yesterday an early win. Nearly 200 nations agreed on how to run a fund to help vulnerable countries deal with more extreme weather. Rich nations pledged at least $260 million to kickstart the program. That comes one day after the United Nations actually declared 2023 the hottest year on record. Well, joining us now to talk about energy is Catherine McGregor, chief executive of the French utility giant NG. Thank you, Catherine, for coming uh, on the program. I know you always give great interviews in trying to understand what money needs um, to, to actually make a difference, where it needs to go, and some of the capital flows that you're seeing. Are you optimistic about COP28? I am optimistic by nature, Francine, and uh, hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I am optimistic. Um, I think already there was some positive dynamics this, uh, at the beginning, which is good. It bodes well, I hope, for the rest of the discussion. Uh, I think if you look at the energy sector, there are talks about um, ambition to tripling the renewables energy by 2030, which is tomorrow. So that's good to double the energy efficiency. So again, this, I think, bodes well and this look to me that it promising commitments that we could get from the COP28. Yeah. Catherine, I can see the, the concern is fossil fuel, right? The fact that we're not reducing it enough. If you read the IRA report, it's something that's been done. Are you worried that here at COP there's also a president that has come under a lot of uh, fire and, frankly, a scandal because apparently he has been maybe pushing some of the fossil fuel contracts to leaders that he was meant to meet with COP? What I'm hearing and I'm, what I want to focus on, obviously, is the fact that there is huge momentum and strong dynamics to build the low-carbon energy system of tomorrow. And for this, you're going to need, Francine, massive renewable development, which you know, seems to be a, a good commitment and there is good dynamics behind that. You're going to need also, obviously, flexibility assets because renewables tend to be intermittent. And what I think we have to focus on, not just green electrons when there is nice weather or when there is sun or when there is wind, but also ability stores to store the energy and to dispatch it when people actually need it. So here you need storage solutions. That's why I'm always pushing the battery theme, which is very important to complement the energy. And then lastly, the molecules. Gas, today is fossil gas, needs to be part of the system of tomorrow because it's a very nice complement to the electrons. Of course, it needs to be low carbon gas. And so here, excitement around everything we can do on biomethane, hydrogen and derivatives of hydrogen to help make sure that this energy mix gets developed in the right way in order for the energy system to be not just low carbon, but also very important, resilient and affordable. I'm sure we'll talk about the social aspect of the energy transition. It's so important to keep the affordability in mind. And so back to your questions, I, sorry. It's for me, what is very important is that we focus investment efforts, um, business and private sector to build this new energy system because it's very difficult to let go of the old system if you don't have a new system that works for everybody. And I believe that what I'm hearing from the COP 
is along those lines. But t tell me a little bit about green hydrogen. We spoke about it in the past, and I guess the uh, Inflation Reduction Act has done wonders in trying to get the price down. Is there is there a price that you're that you're looking at for, for escape velocity, where a lot of these renewables will be, I guess, you know, being able to adopt much more widely. Yeah. So green hydrogen is indeed super exciting because it's going to be the versatile molecule that is going to respond to a lot of the challenges, the transport, heavy transport, right, the industries that are hard to abate, and also can provide storage solutions for the green electrons that hopefully we will have plenty of. So it is indeed part of the solution. What I think is true is that we have been a little bit disappointed on the base of the development of the market. I think you have to understand that a lot needs to happen for this market to indeed mature to, to the level we need. You need regulation. You need a lot of green electrons, a lot. And you also need the infrastructure. And we are working on all of those aspects. When I say we, it's, uh, it's everyone. Uh, on the energy side, a lot on the infrastructure. So, you know, we are testing, for example, storage uh, cavities that today use are used to store natural gas and we're trying to convert them to hydrogen. We're testing some of the pipeline. We're also in, involved in a, a very nice project between Spain, France, mm -hmm. maybe Germany mm -hmm. to transport green hydrogen. So a lot going on, but indeed, I think yeah. it's fair to say that it's taking a little bit longer yeah. to mature, which is why when we talk about green molecules, you always have to think you have today commercial solution yeah. like biomethane, which yeah. is today, and it's the same molecule as natural gas. So it's really a one-for-one -one replacement. And that's exciting to see you know, certain countries recognizing the potential of this molecule. And obviously, NG is very active in, in, in going after it. Are, are you doing anything specifically in the Middle East? Is NG looking at opportunities here? So NG, we have a historical presence here in the Gulf, in the region. Uh, we have a big power producer, but also a water producer. People don't know that, but it was part of our power production presence. And today, as we've done with the rest of the group, we are obviously pivoting our focus and we are investing, indeed, uh, in district cooling solutions. And we have a great partner in Abu Dhabi. So district cooling is a way to provide cooling solution in a very efficient manner. So that's one focus area for us here. And also, of course, green molecules. So we have hydrogen project under development. And lastly, and hopefully, we will do renewables in a couple of countries, uh, Saudi and Abu Dhabi, hopefully, as well. So, uh, yes, yeah, very much important region for us. Um, Catherine, when you look at a lot of the things that actually you're expecting at COP, what are you, you, I know we started the conversation with saying you're optimistic, but you're also optimistic by nature. Is there something within the next six days that you would like to be signed? Is it something on fossil fuel? Is it something on loss and damage that would make a difference to your world when you speak to investors? Yeah, I think loss, loss and damage is, is an example where I think as a citizen, I, I hope that we can move and, and make some agreement. I think on the energy sector, I think for sure having a very strong ambition on what we want to do on renewables, on infrastructure. And I didn't talk so much about transmissions and power network, yeah. which is yeah. a very much and a which key is enabler, crucial. which yeah. is crucial, crucial. Yeah. So we need all that. So that's also very important. And I think to your question on fossil fuel, I think we can't leave it out of the debate. And I think at some point, you know, to be consistent with a net zero, it will have to be yeah. on the agenda, uh, potentially with a calendar. And I, you know, I won't play with the word phase out, phase down. I think you, know, you need a phase down before you have a phase out and a calendar. However, you don't want to create a shock to the system because you know, affordability yes. and just transition has to be part of the equation. Yeah. And I hope that the leaders can figure it out. It's not an easy one to, to solve. Is it much harder with interest rates at 5 6% overall? Because a lot of the projects have to be financed with debt. Interest rates uh, have indeed you know, given a, a bit more challenges to all of us developers, uh, made you know, the, the hurdle rates and, and, and the expectation for our project to be economic a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. But we're finding solutions. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's what we do as companies. We're finding solutions to these challenges, and we continue to do renewable projects in an economic way. Mm -hmm. Without economic sustainability, we don't have sustainability. So I'm very, very focused you know, in my job to make sure that we do renewables, we do this energy transition in a way that makes sense from an economic yeah. standpoint. And despite high interest rates, which has put a challenge Pressure. onto us, for sure, yeah. uh, we continue to find projects. Uh, there is obviously customers that are very keen to secure their energy 
green electrons and to have also the, the visibility on a longer term. Mm -hmm. And so that helps us de-risk the project mm -hmm. and continue to find good projects to deliver, which Kathy, is exciting. It is exciting. Thank you so much You're for welcome. being here with us today. That was the NG Chief Executive Officer, Catherine McGregor. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, throughout the day. Plenty coming up at the UN Climate Conference here in Dubai. This is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse, and I'm Francine Lacroix here in Dubai. Today we're from COP28, so there's quite a lot, of course, uh, going on. Now, this is one of the couple of things that we're looking for. We look at loss and damage. Now, we did have a little bit of a win yesterday. Uh, I am delighted. I think we're joined by the Chief Executive Officer of Veolia. She's Estelle Bakyanov, and she's with me. Estelle. I don't know if we can hear you. I think we can hear you. We're just checking. Hopefully we can, right? I think we can. Can, can we hear our guest? I think we can hear. Great. There you go. Thank you for joining us. Let's talk about plastics. When you look at some of the hopes here and some of the concerns that we have in general, what can be achieved? I mean, your world is one of recycling, of, of, of trying to do some good, but are you getting enough support from leaders? Um, I guess, you know, the, the reason why I'm here and uh, why we have other chief exec is like business can be a force for good as well. And the solution lies in hybrid solution, uh, hybrid uh, partnership, if you want, between public and public. Mm -hmm. And, you know, bringing the solution providers together to try to scale up and speed up is exactly what it is about. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see the glass half full or half empty, but I think a lot is moving on. Uh, and we need to speed up and in terms of plastic recycling, uh, as well as uh, um, water um, preservation, uh, which, as you know, is one of the main consequences of global warming. Uh, it is uh, the uh, mitigation, but the adaptation element is about water. So solution provider being brought together and PPP is absolutely critical here. But do you think something you know, concretely will be signed? I don't know if it's extra money being poured into helping your industry also arrive into countries that need it most so that a solution can be circular and therefore better for the planet. Uh, for me, the big, uh, the big hope is about method. Uh, that we will set together, uh, we meaning, you know, the global leaders uh, today at Dubai, uh, a target and an ambition and a trajectory to reduce methane emission. Uh, Veolia is a solution provider into that, uh, but, you know, uh, I think it's a super critical element uh, which can be achieved, hopefully, at the COP. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, I guess, you know, th there has undeniably been a back step in some pledges, and I don't know whether this is because of the cost of money, we're also dealing with two wars, a lot of companies, a lot of investors maybe want to put their money elsewhere and are a little bit more cautious. Do you feel, when you speak to investors, when you look at, you know, starting on some projects, do you still feel a little bit of hesitation? I guess uh, if the initial reason why you're doing something about the environment is uh, just uh, because you feel like there is an external pressure, then maybe there could be a little bit of uh, going down at one point if you feel a bit less pressure. But if you feel, and I think it's the case of many, many companies, that the reason why you're doing that is because it's good for the business and it's a more high rent as well, uh, then I still have a lot of customers who are asking for solutions now and irrespective of the global crisis you've mentioned. And I would say um, it ticks a lot of boxes because it could be, uh, you know, adaptation and mitigation uh, can be uh, a way for business to be more resilient, mm -hmm. uh, to be more locally sourced mm -hmm. and not depending on, you know, like worldwide supply chain, mm -hmm. uh, as well as to create job mm -hmm. and uh, growth in our economies. So. Um, I guess it can be going together. Yeah. And if I go the next step, sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about finding you know, local sources of energy or recycling, uh, it gets you more independent from the rest of the world. So I think you know, all the various objectives can go together into ecological transformation, which is you know, paramount. Mm -hmm. Estelle, thank you so much for joining us. That was the Veolia Chief Executive Officer, Estelle Brakianov. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, from COP here coming up. Also a conversation on healthcare, an exclusive interview with the AstraZeneca Chief Executive Officer. He's Pascal Sorio. as we continue our coverage of day two of COP28 here in Dubai. This is Bloomberg.
to our special coverage from COP28. I am delighted. Now, talk a little bit about healthcare. We've uh, talked about energy. We've also talked about recycling. But now we're joined by the AstraZeneca chief executive for an exclusive conversation. He's Pascal Sorio. Pascal, thank you for joining us. I don't know whether there will be big announcements. We're expecting quite a lot, actually, from AstraZeneca in terms of decarbonization, in terms of, I guess, pledges from the healthcare system. Yes, uh, it's great to be here, Francine, as always. Uh, yeah, big announcements, actually. Uh, we have made a number of uh, announcements over time. We work together as an industry to reduce the carbon emissions. It's important to remember the healthcare sector as a whole generates 5% of global carbon emissions, up to 8% in some developed countries. And uh, everybody's working hard as a company. Uh, since 2015, even though the company doubled in size, we've reduced our emissions by 60% also reduce water by 20 percent, waste, waste by 20 percent. This is how, Pascal, is it in the packaging, is it in actually sourcing more locally, or is it in water usage? It's really, first of all, reducing energy consumption as much as we can in every site. Um, it's moving to uh, biogas, for instance, in the UK and uh, in the US. We have nine manufacturing plants in the US. We're moving to biogas instead of fossil gas. It's uh, moving to wind farms in Sweden, in, in China. It's transitioning our uh, car fleet to uh, EV cars. It's all of, all of those things, um, uh, using green energy for our, for our, uh, our sites whole sorts of uh, initiatives across the company uh, to reduce carbon emissions. Is it easier to do it in the U.S. because of the Inflation Reduction Act and some of the innovation that's going on in the country? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, we're able to do it everywhere. In the U.S., of course, the IRA is a big incentive for everybody to do it. But in Europe, we all know, uh, European commissions and the countries, they want to uh, decarbonize. The U.K. has a big agenda, and the U.K. has done a lot in the carbon agenda. Um, we, um, you know, are really reducing everywhere we can, uh, and it's it's a big job that everybody is working towards. And the industry has committed to work together. We just announced a big investment, a collaborative investment across a number of companies in China, India, to source green energy for ourselves and our suppliers, yeah. uh, and it will produce 70 megawatts of electricity, reduce carbon emissions by 120,000 tons of carbon, the equivalent of 25,000 cars taken off the road. Well, how confident, and you mentioned the UK, and there was debate on whether some of their green energy policies were green enough or whether there was a retrenchment. But how's it going in the UK? It's actually going well, I think, overall. You know, of course, we always, all of us, would like to move faster than we do collectively. But, but I think it's moving in the right direction. The government has the right uh, policy in place. We also have to give ourselves a bit of time in some cases, of course, for this transition. But I think overall the UK, in terms of carbon emissions per capita, is in a good place and moving in the right direction. We also, as a company, are investing $400 million in moving our propellant to a uh, carbon-free propellant for our asthma and COPD medicines. Um, so we're doing all sorts of things, really, to reduce carbon emissions across the entire sector. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, away, I guess, from, from COP28, some of the hot ticket in town since we got over COVID, presumably for, for the moment, is, of course, some of the obesity drugs. What are plans for AstraZeneca to, to, for that market? Yes, there's a big unmet need, of course. Uh, people need to lose weight. Uh, they also need to uh, gain muscle mass. It's important to have muscles because it drives your insulin sensitivity reduce, reduces the risk of hypertension, diabetes, etc., kidney disease, etc. Uh, on our side, we are working on uh, oral, uh, the so-called oral GLP-1, the similar to the product that are injected, because we believe that if you really want to bring this product to many, many people, oral, the oral route is going to be uh, a good one. We're also working on other type of uh, weight loss drugs yep. that will help uh, people lose more fat and less muscle. Right protect the muscle and lose the so-called white fat, yeah. which is the, the big problem. But if you look, for example, at your RSV shots, there's, there's so much demand. How much is it to, or how much can you increase supply by? Yeah, so here we're talking about uh, RSV, which is a virus that is affecting yeah. uh, adults, but in our case, babies, newborns. So we have an antibody that is protecting babies for six months, and then, then they are out of the woods, if you want. Um, and the demand has exploded because uh, there is a big RSV epidemic in many countries. But we are able to, co to cope. Uh, we have increased uh, manuf capacity, manufacturing capacity. We're working very closely with our partner Sanofi to bring this uh, product to as many babies as possible. 
There's been a large demand in France, a large demand yeah. in the US yeah. and other yeah. countries, Spain and many others. But we are able to cope okay. overall. It's not available yet in the UK, will it be? Well, in the UK, we basically uh, are waiting for uh, NHS and uh, NICE to reimburse it and order it. Um, but, uh, you know, we can only supply when we get an order, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. As thank always, you. that was Pascal Osorio, the AstraZeneca Chief Executive Officer. Now, we'll have plenty more from Dubai here at COP28. I have to say, it's pretty incredible when you walk the corridors. There's floods and floods of people trying uh, to get to where they need to be. A lot of the focus is on loss and damage. A lot of the finance uh, will be, of course, the focus will be on finance um, later in the day, where we're expecting also possibly some big announcement from asset managers on actually putting capital flows to where they need to be. Coming up, we'll be joined by the president of Sri Lanka, also for a good conversation and an exclusive one on what more can be done for some of these economies. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Dubai for COP28. Now, we've had a number of conversations, of course, on the need for uh, greening the economy, on what some of these private companies can do. Joining me now for an exclusive conversation is Raniel Wickramasinghe, the president of Sri Lanka. Mr. President, thank you for giving us a little bit of your very busy schedule to try and understand the complexities of greening an economy that's also um, ha has issues in trying to, to grow. So, first of all, what are some of your green initiatives? Well, our greening initiatives will start with uh, encouragement of the renewable energy. Sri Lanka has, I think, uh, we will have about 100 gigawatts finally of solar wind power available, which is far more than our needs. So it's a question of investing, and the investors will be able to, at some stage, export it, either in the form of green hydrogen or into India. We are having energy connectivity to India. So this is just a start. And Mr. President, is it easy to find that capital? Are investors happy to come into Sri Lanka and give you some of what's needed? Yes, once we start, which we have already done with two or three investors we are negotiating, other will come in. I think there is hunger for good investments. And especially a country like Sri Lanka, where we will have excess energy available. But is this because there are opportunities of a good return, or is this just because it's the right thing to do? Like, what is your, what do you tell investors who are thinking about coming? Investors will not come to do the right thing. They are coming because they think there's a good return. Up for them to judge. Can you we want to open up the sector. How, how big do you want it to be? So you, you, you mentioned a couple of things, also looking at exporting possibly to some of, of your uh, of your neighborhood. How how quickly could that come, that you're doing it, so it, much it, green it, energy? It will it, 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 take a bit of time. The connectivity has to be, uh, we have started the connectivity. Mm -hmm. We just agreed on it a few months ago. And in India, we'll have a big demand. I mean, there's already Bangladesh, Bhutan, and uh, Nepal are connected to India. So that's one. But then we find we will have sufficient even for other purposes. Sri Lanka also has its economic challenges. So by getting green investment, could that propel actually GDP and and also labor? It, it will certainly help us with the GDP, but it's a commitment that we get to 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. Actually, Sri Lanka is also planning to uh, speed up its net zero campaign from 2050 to 2040. Mr. President, how are the conversations going here at COP28? There was an agreement yesterday in terms of some of the things. It's, it was unexpected because at other COPs, there's always been infighting. Is there a willingness of leaders to come together? Well, we have to show the willingness. We haven't had that many agreements. But uh, this, this fortnight is crucial. We've got to show the world that we can deliver. That's, that's, that's the question because there are too many disagreements among us. I don't, see the, I don't see the need for that, because if we all go along with the IPCC uh, recommendations, then the differences can be only in the means of implementing. 
not on the policy to be followed. But what does success look like to you? Is it money actually being pledged in the right places, or is it agreements on cutting gas emissions? It could be fossil fuels. Is it pledges no, there, or there money? No, there is no agreement on fossil fuel, and there are no pledges on the table either. But should there be? There should be at least a commitment. No one is sort of uh, even willing to enter into a commitment, yeah. so as the loss and damage fund uh, report showed. But is it a worry that actually the, the president of COP comes from big oil with reports that he was also trying to get funds for advancing fossil fuel interest whilst being in charge of COP? No, when we, when we selected UAE, we knew that UAE is a uh, petroleum exporting, gas exporting country. So then whoever comes from UAE has to be connected. UAE hasn't got, they don't cultivate tea, so that's, that's the outcome of it. But, but do you think still enough can be done? Well, yes, I think there's on this matter. Enough can be done. Let, let the UAE, but you have to have a decision. Either if you don't want extra countries that are involved in the oil industry, then don't have them. But if you want them to chai, then you have to accept the fact that they are not going to shut down their fossil fuel today to accommodate the COP28, uh, but then you have to get them in and discuss with them too. Okay, Mr. President, thank you so much for joining us. That was, of course, Raniel Wigra Masingi, the president of Sri Lanka. We'll have plenty more heads of state right here joining us on set at the Bloomberg set at COP28. So we're joined shortly by Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the prime minister of Greece, for an exclusive conversation as well. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Dubai from COP28. Now, we're joined exclusively by Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the Prime Minister of Greece. Prime Minister, thank you for joining us. I mean, it's been quite a week for you, I have to say, and the UK. The Prime Minister of the UK, uh, Rishi Sunak, cancelled the meeting with you, accused you of grandstanding and ruled out allowing some pantheon uh, sculptures to leave the British Museum. You seem to have a cordial meeting with his opposition. Well, Francina, you know, in, in the spirit of uh, um, long-standing good relations our two countries have, and which I certainly intend to preserve, I don't have much to add um, uh, to this uh, topic, nor do I want to get um, um, embroiled in, in domestic um, uh, UK politics. I think we've said any, everything we have to say uh, about this issue, and I really don't want to comment more about it. Uh, have you spoken to the Prime Minister? Is it, do you feel like it's now behind you? Well, I would certainly want to leave this um, uh, unfortunate incident uh, uh, behind me, but it always takes two to tango. Have you spoken to him? No. Okay, maybe he'll get a call, maybe after this interview. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister, there's a lot to be done here at COP28. Are you confident that there's going to be something meaningful instead of just talk? Well, this is an important COP. It's a stock-taking um, uh, COP. I think there is uh, a very understandable concern uh, about the track uh, we are on uh, and about uh, the gap between our um, uh, nationally defined contributions and where we need to get to. And coming from a country which uh, suffered uh, the devastating consequences of the climate crisis uh, this summer, I cannot just uh, but urge uh, everyone to, to be more ambitious in their goals. Uh, uh, Greece has done uh, its own uh, fair share of the heavy lifting. We have reduced our emissions by 43% uh, since 2005. That is the fastest reduction of emissions of any European country. Granted, we also had an economic uh, crisis to deal with, but we still remain fully uh, committed towards meeting our mitigation targets, but obviously we can't do it alone. I mean, you also have growth, which helps if you yeah. have money to spend on this. So yeah. uh, what kind of advice do you give? I mean, there are leaders here, and without maybe giving them advice, like, mm -hmm. what's the biggest challenge right now to a leader that wants to do good, but that can't quite get there? Uh, well, listen, we have to set long-term targets and medium-term targets. I think um, decarbonizing our power sector is the obvious way to, to go in terms of increasing the penetration of uh, renewables. This is something we've done in Greece. We're a top 10 producer of renewables um, globally, and we intend to continue down that path. But we also need more investments in our grids in order to actually make uh, renewables um, uh, work. Uh, so this would be the number one priority. And then, of course, uh, you know, obvious energy savings, looking at our, at our houses uh, and how we can uh, achieve quick wins uh, through positive NPV measures. 
Prime Minister, what do you worry about the most right here in Europe right now? There was a, a pretty shocking election in the Netherlands that not many people are expecting with, with the far right to win. Does this change also commitment to, to greening the economy? Um, well, look, uh, we are committed to the Fit for 55 agenda. Uh, and uh, important legislative initiatives have been passed. Uh, at the same time, we need to listen to our people and understand that we cannot uh, uh, place more burden on the less privileged ones. Uh, and that is why the total, uh, let's say, rebalancing uh, of our fiscal approach, making sure that uh, we use the process of growth to support the more vulnerable households, uh, is uh, it's so important uh, in our case. And to make sure that uh, uh, a lot of people can actually tangibly benefit uh, from the green transition. For example, uh, in Greece we have uh, an extensive penetration of thermal solar. You just heat our water using the solar energy um, and it's a very cheap measure that helps reduce electricity bills. So make sure that we focus on those measures uh, where we can actually demonstrate to people that we take care of their concerns and we don't put unnecessary burden on them. But overall, do you worry that there's a tilt, that there's more d domestic uncertainty in a lot of big European uh, countries? Yeah, I'd say yes and, right. yes and no, but you look at other countries, you look at Poland, uh, you look at Greece, for example, reasonable, yeah. moderate, centre-right You got elected um, in the summer. Government no. with a strong majority, a very strong mandate to deliver growth, um, uh, growth rate uh, way higher than the Eurozone uh, uh, average. These are all good signals. You can actually run a moderate centre-right government, um, uh, obtain a large majority, uh, as long as you continue to deliver benefits uh, for, uh, you know, for citizens. Do, do you worry, Prime Minister, and I'm, I'm talking a lot about worries because it sees that, the, you know, the economy overall, the world is not getting easier to deal with. We talk about onshoring, we talk, for example, about a lot of the green technologies coming back to the U.S., we talk about the rift between U.S. and China. If you look at these, these big issues, what do they mean for Europe? Well, um, Europe uh, has an important uh, uh, role to play in terms of covering out its own uh, agenda regarding its own strategic uh, uh, autonomy. Um, we are leaders in the climate change, but we can't do it alone. And certainly we don't want to put uh, uh, European businesses at a disadvantage compared to the U.S. or to Chinese businesses. Look at shipping, for example. We want to decarbonize uh, shipping, but shipping is a global industry. And we want to make sure that uh, our shipping is not uh, uh, placed in a position where you just have, uh, you know, uh, ship owners move their flags to other countries. But so how do you do that? Again, it's, it's extremely difficult. And if you look at shipping, I mean, it, it takes a huge amount of capital at a time where interest rates are high to either rebuild or actually repurpose a lot of these shipping. Beyond. Well, you, you do it by offering the right incentives and by making sure that you spread the, you know, the, the burden equally on, on everyone. Not an easy exercise. Uh, you need to use technology um, um, uh, and to make sure that we're at the forefront of the technological innovation. But we certainly want to, want to, want to get to that point. Um, Prime Minister, Greek, uh, Greece is actually aiming to, to be an exporter of green energy to Central and Southeast Europe as more renewable power comes online. At the same time, you're also looking at hydrocarbon exploration. How do you marry the two? Um, we need base load power. We need natural gas for the foreseeable future. But at the same time, we can significantly expand our uh, green production capacity, which is something we intend to do. We want to be an exporter um, of green power in the medium to long term. In the short term, we want to make sure that we cover uh, the requirements of our neighboring countries in terms of offering them access to natural gas, which is something that we do through significant investment in our infrastructure. So do you think you can help them meet some of their priorities? We, we are doing that already. We're doing that already um, by covering the needs of Bulgaria. Yeah. We're exporting gas to yeah. Moldova. And we're building the necessary infrastructure to import gas um, uh, into, uh, uh, into Europe uh, through northern Greece. So we want to be a provider of energy security uh, for many European countries. How long, Prime Minister, will it take to, for, for that infrastructure actually to be put in place? The FSRU um, is arriving in Alexandrupoli in a, in a month. So the first infrastructure is already in place. If there's one thing that you think COP leaders need to get right in the next two weeks, what is it? So, to make sure that uh, we ramp up our ambitions. What we're doing is not enough. We're paying the consequences. Uh, and we need to send out a signal of, of extreme urgency out of, out of this meeting. But this is what? Pledges on methane? What, are, are there concrete methane, pledges? Uh, methane power, power production mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, in the short term and, of course, climate financing for those who need it the most. Prime Minister, thank you so much for joining us. That was Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the Prime Minister of Greece. Now, coming up, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the European Union, of course, some of their pledges, greening the economy. Uh, we'll be speaking to Maros Setkovic. He's the Executive Vice President for the Green Deal at the European Commission. He'll be joining us live here from Dubai. This is Bloomberg.
The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Dubai from COP28. Now let's bring in Maros Sekvich. He's Executive Vice President for the Green Deal at the European Commission. Thank you so much for joining us. There's so much going on here at COP. And frankly, Absolutely. one of the main questions that we have is what kind of language, language will we end up with on, on fossil fuel, which is, I, I guess, the biggest point of tension given we're here at the UAE, a big fossil fuel provider. I think it's, it's quite clear that uh, uh, from the European Union, there will be a clear message that uh, we are doing our utmost to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Europe. So we'll do our task and we'll be minus 57% by, by 2030. But we are responsible only for 7% of the greenhouse gas emission in the world. So we need to tackle this remaining 93%. And I think we can do it uh, only uh, in the way if we would uh, proceed uh, with the phasing out of the fossil fuels. I know that it's a big topic for the discussions. So I think that uh, we'll be uh, working a lot with the language around innovated uh, uh, fossil fuels using uh, all kinds of new technology. But I think. Uh, for us, uh, the ambition is very clear. We will be climate uh, neutral continent in 2050, and we hope uh, the rest of the world will join us very, very quickly. But will there be, a, if not a concrete pledge, something concretely from this region that's that's so needed? If you look at the IEA report on fossil fuels, I think that uh, in all, I mean, uh, discussions so far, also this region was um, um, constructively looking at uh, different options. I don't know if we'll make it. I would say to that uh, final frontier because. Uh, uh, from the perspective of the Paris Agreement, this is the most important COP since Paris. And, uh, and I think that this global stock take and the fact that uh, clearly we are off uh, of, of mark where we wanted to be by this time because this year uh, was the hottest uh, we had uh, since we started to measure the temperature. A few times we made it over 1.5 degrees Celsius. So I think there's enough evidence yeah. that, that uh, uh, we have to go in, in that direction. And of course, we hope for constructive cooperation with all partners, including our hosts and of course, uh, everyone from this region. How much will the EU contribute to loss and damage? First and foremost, we've been uh, at, uh, the, <clears throat> we've been at the birth of uh, this uh, idea in Sharm el Sheikh, and we've been, of course, uh, very happy that we have a deal, mm -hmm. that these would be the pledges coming from uh, different uh, member states. But I think as a team Europe, we will be well over um, 220 million. Mm -hmm. I would say at least because this is uh, still, I would say, the, the, the process. We are at the beginning. But I think as uh, we did, uh, and, um, uh, and honored our commitment if it comes to climate finance, where uh, Europe contributed in 2022 more than $30 billion uh, in public finances and more than $12 billion in, in private. Also, in loss and damage, we'll play our role. We'll be a constructive partner. And I think through this Team Euro uh, approach we are showing to the developing world uh, that uh, we want to do our utmost to help them. Yeah. But so, if, so there's no fund <coughs> per se. Or there's, you don't have a number for loss and damage specifically yet. I think that we know what uh, the Europeans are ready to put uh, yeah. on the table. And as I said, these are the first days. So, I mean, um, it was already publicly announced that uh, uh, at least uh, 200 uh, uh, 20 million euros uh, and of course uh, our uh, let's say outreach is uh, also very much aimed uh, at uh, the countries who can afford uh, to pledge uh, the big emitters big countries uh, uh, like China countries from these regions because I think we need to broaden the base of the of the contributors and at the same time we would like to focus uh, the use of this loss and damage uh, fund to the least developed uh, countries but also to the small island states because I think that they really need it most um, talk to me a, a little bit um, about whether you're worried that there have been elections in Europe that have gone to extreme parties that actually don't believe in the green transition and what that means for the implementation of the Green Deal. I think it's true that uh, we have uh, lots of uh, anxiety in Europe and I think uh, the primary reason for that is that we had accumulation of crises, we had COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, uh, high energy prices, high inflation, all these terrible events unfolding in the Middle East. So the people are anxious and they are of course worried about their uh, living standards and I think uh, uh, from our side therefore it's absolutely important to 
show also the ability to, to listen to their concerns, to explain and to simply highlight uh, that uh, the problems they're facing, they are not linked with the Green Deal, but the fact that we've been kind of hooked on the Russian fossil fuels for, for, for many years. And the only way to get out of there is to, to move towards future and have more renewables and uh, push the energy prices down. But, uh, Vice President, are you worried that actually this phenomenon will continue as people are unhappy, so that we'll elect more extremes, either to the right or to the left, and it'll make it more difficult for achieving the, the green goals. Therefore, we start it uh, with so-called green dialogues because I think that we really need uh, to, to increase the interaction and communication with our citizens, yeah. simply to show the attitude that we are not only ready to provide the recipes, yeah. but they are also ready to, to listen but, to you. What are the concerns and how can we address them? But what are the concerns? Is there, is there a problem with climate change or ESG or, or green that people under, they, they feel it's far behind them? It's, is it because it costs too much? No, I think that uh, from one side there is big support uh, uh, for the Green Deal and tackling the climate change because the people simply know what, what was happening this summer, this autumn. We never had uh, uh, so much devastation because of the uh, weather-related uh, uh, disasters. I think that uh, the um, uh, that anxiety, uh, which is demonstrated by many people, is more or less linked uh, with, with the cost of living, with, uh, with the worries how this would affect uh, the households. And therefore, I think we have to show more empathy and be in a closer interaction with uh, our citizens to explain and to tell them, look, we are ready to adjust, uh, we are ready to recalibrate uh, if necessary, simply uh, because we believe that Green Deal uh, yeah. has to have a public support. It's there for you and for us. It's not only the policy, but also our growth yeah. strategy. But Vice President, I mean, I was looking at some of the numbers of investment going to the U.S. I mean, it's huge, especially for onshoring, so businesses that are pouring ma yeah. money back. And if you look at the graph, it's, I mean, it's exponential. Can Europe come up with something that will give us the same amount of, uh, of investment per capita? Yeah, of course, we are discussing this with our uh, American partners because I, I think that uh, it's such an important moment of history like now. I, I think it would be much better to build bridges across the Atlantic. And uh, this is what is permanently on the table with our uh, American partners. So what, um, uh, of course, we are, uh, we are doing, we are mobilizing every single uh, euro we have uh, from the from the uh, European budget and to bring more of the private capital to leverage uh, to leverage these funds and to be of course more creative how to work uh, with our industry so we started yeah. with the so-called clean transition dialogues where we are really working um, hands-on uh, with uh, the industry which is most affected by the green transition and we are looking for the ways how to yeah. how to help them because we want them to stay yeah. in Europe and prosper in Europe. Vice President, in two seconds, you, you spoke to David Cameron this week. Was it about Rwanda? Did he give you any assurances about what they'll do with immigrants? I mean, um, this was this was not the, the, the topical issue. We went uh, through all the difficulties linked with visitable agreement, trade and cooperation agreement, and, and, and that was, I would say, the subject of our discussion. Thank you so much, Vice President. That was the Executive Vice President of the European Commission's Green Deal, Maros Sekfovic. So we'll have plenty more, of course, from COP throughout the day. This is what we have coming up, some of the key conversation with leading voices. We'll have Mariam Almeri, the Minister of Climate Change and Environment in the United Arab Emirates. We also speak to Bill Gates and many, many more. Sultan Ahmed bin Salah also joins us. This is Bloomberg.